Well, good morning uh, from Middle Tennessee. I'm Tammy Jones. Hi, and I'm Nancy Johnson from Cape Cod, Massachusetts. And thank you for joining us today on Structuring Lessons to Develop Mathematical Thinkers. Today, uh, what we're going to be working on is having our students become doers of mathematics, um, investing them into their learning. Um, we're going to be starting out with a, selecting some tasks that we're going to be using primarily to encourage curiosity, um, discussion, collaboration, uh, and written and verbal reflection. So we've got a lot on our plate there. We're going to be using technology as a tool for investigation. Um, we're not pressing buttons. We are looking for let's investigate, explore, interpret what we see. And finally, we're going to be um, extending the content um, that you're going to be seeing in this activity so that we are trying to meet the needs of all of our students and their learning styles. This quote was something I, I came about seeing quite a few years ago and thought it was so appropriate because when we have our mathematics classroom, um, oftentimes or most of the time, our students are coming in with their preconceived ideas about their ability and what they think about math. And so much of our job as a math teacher is to bring them into our math family and make them feel supported and confident and um, willing to share ideas and to take risks. And so all the activities that we've built around um, our lesson today are invested in our students. And you're so right, Nancy. So today we're gonna take a classic Texas Instruments activity that you can get free from the website. We also include it in the materials. It's downloaded in the packet. Um, and we're gonna create an entire lesson where all of your students are going to be discussing, they're going to be writing, they're going to be persevering, they're going to be thinking individually as well as collaboratively. And much like a five course dinner, that's kind of going to be our analogy in a fine restaurant. We are going to take the TI lesson and how we have extended that to become the main course. So we're going to provide for you some structures and routines to use in your classroom. Those will become the appetizers, um, the soup, the salad, the dessert to help you do this. Our goal today is to transform our mathematics classrooms to be exciting and engaging opportunities for our students. We are going to use TI technology, as Nancy said, as a tool of investigation and of exploration. We're going to be using the TI 84 CE. However, everything that we do can easily be adapted to the Inspire. So, with that understanding, we are trying to make sure that our students are going to be engaged in doing mathematics. And you'll notice we've got some amazing action words here. Um, notice, wonder, imagine, ask, investigate, um, figure, connect, prove, um, discuss, ask why not. These are all verbs that are indicating action for our students. And if we want our students to be involved, we are trying to bring together all of these um, different actions and involve our whole, all of our students. So we want to begin by putting you into some of these action words. So are you curious today? We want you to think about what kinds of questions you might be thinking, what kinds of questions your students might think about this slide. So what thoughts come to your mind? Type us a few in the chat as we're sitting here looking at this. Think about what might connect all of these slides. So we'll give you a minute or two to look. Um, 
at some of these and see if we have any takers to give us some ideas in the chat. So what questions, Mike? Tra oh, transformations. <laughs> wow. Nancy, they got it on the first get-go. And the symmetry. Very good. We have very good people this morning. Tina. Hey, Tina from Tennessee. Um, just had a birthday. What, what does what, left pick have to do with math? Okay, go for it, Nancy. Well, one of the things I was going to say here is we're trying to appeal to multiple learning styles or, or different diverse learning styles. And so we've put in here, as most of you have said, transformation. And then I see somebody has put on the picture on the left as a metamorphosis, which essentially is a transformation. So we're appealing to you know, a student who may not be, you know, as uh, prone to look at a graph and say, oh, what's going on there with that? That appears to be an absolute value function or, you know, where the geometry where we've got triangles that are being um, reflected and, and translated, or we're looking at, you know, a dilation. But here on the left, we're looking at an actual real life example of a transformation. Okay. So today, the way we're going to start with our appetizer piece of our uh, lesson that we're putting together is by the use of some instructional routines. And instructional routines, you know, um, some of us are familiar with one or another of them. We're going to pick out a few that we're going to be using. These instructional routines help to provide a safe environment for both the teacher and the student because both know what to expect in terms of the structure. So what we're doing is we're trying to bring in the voices of all our students and by having an instructional routine where they feel safe um, and, and know that structure, we're enabling those students to be able to engage in learning and all voices are respected. So as we're looking through some of these next slides, if you want to share some of your favorite routines or structures in your classroom, so people will be able to see those and I think um, that they might will probably capture the chat, then you'll have those later. We're going to start with one of my favorites. It is your first appetizer today. It is called a think right pair share. Most folks are familiar with think pair share. However, this is a think right because if we're in a classroom and the teacher asks us to think right to think pair share, and Nancy's sitting in the front of the class and Nancy had that wonderful first answer. And by the time it gets to me, it's like, yeah, I agree with Nancy, and I probably have even forgotten what my original thought even was. So we're going to do um, two strategies here for you. We're going to do a timed writing activity. We're going to give you 27 seconds to write in the chat some differences between a linear and nonlinear function. However, for a third layer, we're going to add a waterfall. So you're getting the think right pair share of the timed writing and waterfall. Okay. So three appetizers are to choose from here. Do not hit enter on what you write in the chat until we tell you to. So 27 seconds starting now. What are some differences between linear and nonlinear functions? Then when we say go, you may hit enter, but not before. I feel like we need to play Jeopardy here or something. The everybody is writing. And 27 seconds because people know 30, they know 45. Nancy pointed out there's 27 seconds on the clock that I put on the slide. <laughs> So, at this point, let's make the waterfall happen. Those of you that are still writing, you have a second more. Those of you that are done, here we go and the waterfall happens. This is a great virtual activity to capture some assessment probes. And my goodness, do we not have wonderful things, Nancy, coming in? Oh, we have in behavior. Somebody's been in pre-cal today. Uh, straight line, nonlinear, dependency, Depends. constant rate, my goodness. Uh, sequential one is all over the place. I like that one. Uh, a degree of it, most one. Oh, I am so glad, Samantha, that you used the word degree. Vocabulary is so instrumental. And as teachers, 
we are the ones at the front of the classroom that are monitoring that attending to precision with our vocabulary and our notation. Okay. <laughs> Anything else you want to point out before we move I, to our appetizer? I like the uh, diversity in our responses here from, you know, nonlinear to turning points, um, which right away signifies we're at a level of pre-calc or calc. And then we have nonlinear curves, gaps, etc. So, you know, it's, it is a variety that we're getting here, which is what we'd want to do in our classrooms. The other thing I was thinking with these routines is we started out with giving you 27 seconds in your classroom. If you were doing this, not virtually, obviously, you would always want to guarantee as Tammy was talking about that time for each individual to put together their thoughts. So probably a minute or two before they are writing something down and then again, time for them to pair. Yeah, and, and back to what Nancy said earlier, this gives everybody a voice. And if you're in the classroom, the responses do not necessarily have to be verbal. If your student's voice allows them to enter the conversation through a drawing, they can do a drawing and that would be totally acceptable because that would show you where their starting point is. Okay, so on to our next appetizer, Nancy. <laughs> okay, so we're we're trying to get ready um, for our main course here, but we are bringing in another instructional routine, um, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, Notice and Wonder. Um, if you want more information about Notice and Wonder, nctm.org is a great source. And you'll notice uh, in the little table that we provided, I notice and I wonder, those two icons come from um, NCTM. So we have snail for notice and we have owl for wonder. So plenty of resources there. But what we're gonna do right now is have you do some noticing and wondering. Um, this routine in the classroom would be again, beginning with quiet think time. And after we've had our quiet think time, we would want our students again to write down either on their own personal whiteboard or somewhere where it's visible as the teacher is walking around, looking over shoulders um, and getting an idea of what the students are, what their thinking is, which is, you know, awesome for us as teachers to know where our students were getting that window into their thoughts. Um, here, what we're gonna have you do is take a moment um, and try to come up with your notice and wonders. And if I were in the classroom, I would be looking for an indication, whether it's through eye contact or a hand movement to let me know that all of my students have at least come up with one notice and one wonder. So we're gonna do another waterfall in this case um, because we're doing it virtually. And so we'd like to start with, I'm gonna give you, since I've been talking, I will give you what, about 20 seconds right now to think about everything that you notice. You can put it into the chat, but don't hit enter until we tell you. This is gonna be fun to see what they say. There was such a diverse assortment of answers earlier. I think we might be ready. Okay, let's see what right. the waterfall looks like. Go ahead. Wow. And I hope everybody is taking a look at that chat. And think about as you're doing this, how this is giving us a window into our students thinking. Um, I also wonder like, Today, just listening to our keynote speaker, I was thinking mirrors, windows. Mm -hmm. um, mirror, when you see something that's similar to what you have said. Um, and we see students that are thinking somewhat alike and then the diversity and the, the window into what others are thinking. And, I, and Jenny, I, I love the fact that you said it's not linear and that the curve is blue. I right now can give you names of students that if they would just tell me the curve is blue, 
that is where they start and I would be very happy. So again, all students have a voice. I noticed the change in data as a reclining chair. Yeah. <laughs> Wonder if Tina's sitting in a reclining chair right now. Okay. Are we and, ready to and, move on? And we value all of that. We do. Every single response. Okay, so take a moment and think about what you wonder. And I do see there's already a what I wonder on there several of them, but let's throw in the rest of what we wonder. Okay. Like Rachel's, I wonder what causes the vertical portion. That's an interesting way to say that. Oh, I wonder what context. That's a good one. I wonder what situations could match this graph. Is the range a subset or is it infinite? And then notice similar thinking. Do the lines go on forever? Mm -hmm. Wonder if there's a horizontal asymptote. Haha, <laughs> I wonder what the scale is. Scale is. And that was earlier. Somebody had asked that earlier as well. It's a little bit of our naked math. Yeah, and the data. And somebody had also, Robin had said something about zooming into the data, which is another way you can use your calculator as a tool of investigation, which is nice. Okay. Do we move on? I think we're ready. So before we go any further, just thinking about these two parts of our appetizers, our math instructional routines, um, think about how you would use them in your classroom and think about the insight that they're providing for both you as a teacher um, and your students. I know so often um, as a teacher, I would wonder whether my students understood what I was doing. How do I know what my students are thinking and think about how these routines are providing um, an insight, a, a window into their thinking. And by sharing of these ideas, are we deepening their understanding? And we're also setting that culture for our classroom um, of respect for all of, of these responses. So think about, are there routines that you use in your classroom that you particularly um, like? Would anybody like to throw in the chat some that you use, um, you know, quite often in your classroom? Um, is this something that you've used? Okay, I love using think, write, pair, share. And think about the modalities of think, write, pair, share. You've got the verbal component, you've got a written component, communication. Amanda does use notice and wonder. Okay. And, and she does it weekly. So this is the nice thing. If you do these occasionally, at least like once with a topic or something, that is that just builds some of that structure in your classroom. I love the aha. Yes, in the Mathematician's Notebook, I have my uh oh, and my aha reflection page, the back of each of their input pages. So, yes. Oh, the share and wait. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. Well, let's move on so we have time to play with ours. And you all keep adding so people can read them. Okay. Nancy, our second course. So I think we're getting into, this is our second course leading into our main course. And we didn't know whether this was a soup and salad or whatever to call it, but we start with a graphic organizer. And what we're trying to do here 
is evoke prior knowledge of the topic that we're heading into. So we started out with um, the parent function y equals square root of x, and we're asking for our students to um, give us any information that they can think about about y equals square root of x. But notice it's a little bit guided. It says, what do you notice about the function such as? And here we're bringing in that vocabulary again. So we've got domain, range, intercepts, graph, table of values, um, symmetry. And this is just to kind of spark their thoughts about what they've learned so far. And now we're looking at this radical function, y equals square root of x, and asking, what do you know about it? And again, um, starting out with the graph, and a calculator would certainly be allowed. So, should we have that? Some ideas put in the chat? What would you we want to take a second? Yeah, and let them put up some characteristics. And by the way, we're starting with one that is the square root of x. You can start with anything that's appropriate for your level, even if it's y equals x in middle school, it's fine. Um, and we know we're throwing a lot of things at you. You may have limited time, so you would have to like parse them over maybe a day or two or three days versus if you have a block schedule or something. And and we're kind of giving you an opportunity to pick and choose what you would feel comfortable with. Um, here we we'll start using y equals square root of x, but as Tammy says, it could be used for any function that you are planning to study linear, quadratic, exponential, and so on. So we have relations and functions. The graph begins, I'll have to fetch you, put that in the quotes at the origin. Okay, well, we're gonna move on. You all can keep adding. So we have enough time to get through the main event here. Um, so we are now in the actual meal, the main course. Um, and Nancy's going to guide us through this. I'm going to get to play Vanna because we're getting ready to go to the emulator um, and do a split screen here. Again, the packet that I'm going to be using, you're going to get. Um, this is basically the lesson that TI has just expanded, broken apart, reformatted just a little bit. So, um, I am now on the emulator and hopefully with your screens, you can see the side. Um, okay, this is what we just were working with that you all were talking about. And then here is the second piece and so we've done in the chat if you need me to make it bigger or something. And so we've gone from let's observe and come up with some characteristics. And as I say that, I'm looking in the chat right now, and I love, I feel like Karen, um, hoping that somebody would come up with that graph is just in quadrant one. And that's, that was a very important observation, which if we were in a classroom, you know, we would have probably been hinting towards that. Um, so now we've gone from, um, we're observing to let's do some exploration. And this is where we're bringing our calculator in as a tool for our students to explore. So what we're gonna do here is we're going to introduce the transformation app on the TI-84CE. And so Tammy's gonna go um, step by step with that. So just if you're new to this, just please let us know and we will yeah. adjust our pace. And, and I'm using the SmartView emulator. And if you notice when I, Click apps, it stays red. So if your student looks down and looks back up, they see what you clap. And I always tell my students, I'm lazy. So one of the nice things about the uh, 84, I don't have to scroll down. I can also scroll up because there's a down arrow and transform happens to be at the very bottom. Um, yes, you are getting a copy of this. It's in the packet. So here's my transform. This also works on the old transform on the other 84 family, just not as prettily. So I'm back at my home screen where I was. So, but who cares what happened? 
Transform happens in the y equals. So let's see, Nancy, you want me to put in radical x and the transformation. Let me just give a second to show if you all are not familiar um, and you don't have your math print updated, um, what have you, there is a new feature that's relatively new. If I scroll back over to the left and notice I do have two transforms now, not just the one. And I can change my color. I can change if I want it to play or not. But I now have templates built in for your students. So you have your linear, you have your quadratic forms, you have cubic forms, you have your absolute values, and you have some basic trig. We do not have the radicals I am going to have to input in. So I'm going to go radical, which is second squared, x tau theta button. Then I'm going to come down and I'm putting in uh, radical parentheses, x minus b. All right, Tammy, you oh. forgot your a again. Oh, okay. Let me go back in just a minute. <laughs> now, notice right here, I do have to arrow out. Otherwise, everything stays under the radical. So that's something your students are going to get frustrated because they're going to mess it up a few times. I still mess it up. Then I can do my plus C, um, which is right here. Um, again, a nice shortcut to get back. If I go second left arrow, it takes me all the way back to the front of the line. Second right arrow, that's a little shortcut. I find a lot of um, people do not know. And I want to insert. So we have our insert button. And I did forget the alpha A. So I am going to do alpha A. Okay, Nancy, does that look good? That looks excellent. So now graph it. Sure. Ah. And so it begins. All right. So with this exploration, uh, we start out with, and I think you can, you should be able to read it. Um, we're going to just look at that a value. So we're trying to find out what the effect of changing the a value has on the graph. Um, so Tammy is going to adjust and you will notice that you have a, b, and c at the bottom of the window screen. And Tammy, you want to tell them how you're adjusting? I'm adjusting by up and down moves me through the values and then right or left gives me the ability to manage the increments of raising it or, or lowering it by whatever. I can go to my soft key for setup and I can say if I want to step wherever I want to step. While I'm here, do we want to step down since we want to look at those values that are between? How do you want to step? You want to do a tenth? Yeah. yeah. So right now, what Tammy's doing, the reason why she's doing a tenth is because she's looking at the first part of this um, exploration is taking a look at the A value, but as it is increasing from zero to one. So we needed to change the step so that it wouldn't jump. The step before was one, and we would have missed all those values between zero and one. So now we're taking a look at a step of 0.1 and she's decreasing those values and you know hopefully the student is working on this and seeing what's happening as that graph um, the parent function is y equals square root of x is sitting there for them and now she's gone into it looks like a negative value so she's kind of skipped a little bit around but that's fine should we since on your wonderful organizer you have the table just look at the table and, and by the way, it. once I'm in this app, the view three does not work. So if you wanted to bring the view three up, that's one thing that is not active when this app is running. So second graph for table. And we so underuse tables. I love tables. I would take if I were uh, doing something, I might take a screenshot of this and plop it down as a formative assessment probe to ask them just to find points of interest or to uh, talk about what the table shows about this function for which I have these two values. So. And one of the interesting things here is, is noticing um, that relationship that is going on between 
um, not only our x and y value, which is our square root function, but our x and y2 values. And how are the y1 and y2 values um, related? My app only allows one function and up to three plots, but it's not showing both TA, 84 plus CE. Okay, and somebody says, why not using TI Inspire instead? And the reason why we're not using TI Inspire is it can easily be done on the TI Inspire, um, and it does it very well. Um, the only reason was that so many of our students um, have the 84. So the 84, which we wanted to show the functionality of the 84 as well, but it can easily be adapted for the Inspire. And Aaron, and I'm on the emulator, which has a whole different OS system than the actual calculator. My guess is you have not updated your calculator since the updates happened. I think it's been two summers ago, maybe. So uh, my idea is the reason yours only still has one is that you have not updated the operating system. Yeah, and you can find that out by going to um, yeah. memory and about that second memory and about. Although, don't look at this because it's the emulator and it's different. Right. Okay. So that's the A part. And the A part, the one thing that I would want to emphasize is that it's A times the square root of X minus B that quantity plus C. So we're getting this multiplicative piece versus the B and C values. Um, and it's important in our transformation that they see that that's a um, almost like a scale factor. So when we go to B, I'm going to need to go back to setup to go down to my step, and I'm going to start back at zero and let my step now be one again. So now I can step and I want it to be greater than one. Wow, this is getting really big fast, so I wonder what the table would look like. Wow, I've only clicked how many times, Nancy? Well, you're up to A equals six. And it's almost getting vertical. Yes. Isn't that interesting? So again, the table of values. Um, it is getting much. I, I, as you're, we're doing this, you might be thinking, how would you be using this in the classroom? Um, and it depends whether each one of your students has their own calculator. Are they working together in pairs? But so important for them to be um, exploring and then sharing these ideas over on the right hand side, where we have them describing what's happening to the graph as A is making those changes. And writing the verbal and I was in the pre cal panel earlier and 1 of the things um, that. 1 of the panelists talked about was the lack of. Fluency or functional fluency, especially with multiple representations. So, the fact that you have included the tabular form or the numeric form, as well as the graphical form, and then they are doing the verbal and writing about it. So that's. Just solidifying and consolidating that learning there. Okay. Then do we want to move on down? And it, well, do we well, we move down to where that reflection is. So they've looked at four different cases. Um, they've looked at notice we're going, we kind of skipped over it here, but A values are decreasing. A is now between negative one and zero. So now we have them comparing in Y3 to the opposite of the square root of X. And so the opposite of the square root of X right away, hopefully we notice that that is a reflection. And then once we have dealt with that, 
Okay, there we go. That's very pretty. Um, once we have dealt with that, then we're going to take another look. Is it is it consistent? Um, so we're taking our values uh, between the day values decrease, and they're going to be going between negative one and zero. So if you want them to go between negative one and zero, again, you would have to go in and go into the setup and change your um, step value. Do you mean to do that or not? I, I think that if we had, we got it from before, we okay. should be good. And then again, we're going to let them decrease further. Our step value would go back to one. Is a is less than negative? Um, a is less than negative one. Our B values and C values are both zero. What's happening? And Tammy's now showing us. And remember how steep it got before as the magnitude of the A value got larger, well, as the magnitude of the A value is getting larger, again, it's getting steeper, and hopefully our students would see that. Okay. Then you consolidate the learning again by having them interpret everything they just did and saw and observed. And then do we want to play with B a minute? Sure. Uh, so on A, don't want to make it zero, right? Because if I make it zero, what happens? I have no function. That's kind of the trivial case. Well, so you have function. B. Um, and, and this, I don't know about you, Nancy, but this is, the one, even with my students this semester that are in pre calculus, these transformations that happen right and left that happen to the X along the X axis are always the hardest for them to conceptualize and to understand why they are doing that. So there it goes. I'm moving to the right. And again, we might want to be talking a little bit too about how this graph that's moving to the left or the right is congruent to the parent function. And noticing that that B value is really an additive value. But and again, can we see that in the table. And there we go. We can bring that out in the table as well. That's why it's so important in your classroom to be looking at all the different representations. And that's, I love the fact that the tables are here so they can capture some of that. Okay. Uh, then we go to C, which is really the easy one, right? Because that's the one that they've known since middle school when they did their first basic slope intercept form let me go back over here though i make this ah go back down now that's back to zero all right so b is back to zero and c is going to be changing so we are starting with c at zero and we're going to which way are you going you're using your negative values okay we'll go up yep so now c is getting larger and our graph is again congruent to the parent function. And again, I would love to, you know, point out to my students that C is an additive value and we've got congruent transformations that are going on there. And there it goes. And again, you have them consolidate and explain the difference, which I think is just consolidation is that piece we so miss and do not do. And, and it's that piece we have to plan so carefully and intentionally and deliberately if we, even in a 90 minute block to make sure you have that time for them to consolidation. So the way, uh, the way Nancy has parsed this, 
you know, you could work on A one day, you could work on B one day, you could work on C one day, and they would consolidate at each piece of it, which would be nice. Okay. And it's totally up to the time that you have in your classroom, whether you're working in a block schedule or you're working in a 45 or 50 minute class. So a lot of this is going to be up to how you would use this in your classroom based upon your constraints. And yes, you are going to get the PDF file. So we've saved the best for last, right? Everybody likes dessert. So we have a smorgasbord of desserts. So Nancy, um, let's start with desserts. Well, our desserts are more, um, we've now made our explorations. We've come to our conclusions. We've reflected. You might have had, if you were doing this in class, a class discussion so that um, everybody is on board and understands what they have um, come to as a final big picture conclusion. And so now this is an activity that's called the info gap. Um, I first came across it when I was um, looking at some of the materials that illustrative mathematics has. And um, from there, I kind of um, took it and made it my own. So um, an info gap is a partner activity. So usually two students, if you have an odd number of students in your class, um, again, another instructional routine. So once you've done it a few times, the students know what to expect. And what happens is, is that you make up cards. And so you'll see I have card one info and card one problem. So one student is going to get the information and one student gets the problem. Neither one knows what the other has um, in terms of information that has been put on that card. And what I do with my students is I have them stand back to back because the um, powerfulness of students having to communicate with each other um, is amazing. And this is usually one of my moments when I'm like listening to the kids um, speak about mathematics and try to explain um, what they're doing. But the point here is the person who has the um, problem card asks the info person a question. Um, so the problem person has, in this case, the very first card says, give an equation for the transformation function. So um, the student would probably say, you know, and you can start out anywhere. Um, could you tell me, let's say, what, you know, what function we're working on? And the info person would then say, well, why? Why do you need this? Because at the end, what's going to happen is both students need to solve the problem individually. And so the person who has the information doesn't know what the question is. So they're trying to get information from the problem um, student. And so when the problem student finally asks all of their questions that they need, the info person has asked um, each time, why do you need this? At the end, when the problem student rests their questions, then it's time for them to solve the problem. So imagine your students standing back to back. I usually had them with um, each one of them with a mini whiteboard. And so they're recording what each other is saying. And then they are going to go ahead and solve their problem. When they finally solve their problem, they then can share with each other. And it is often very interesting to see um, the um, differences and similarities in how they went about each one of these problems that they have. So in this case, we gave you an example of three different cards that you could use. Um, so you would have three pairs. And if you had an odd number, what I usually have done is had one student double up um, with either the info or the problem. Um, or you can have one student be an additional recorder to compare. 
Um, but in any, either case, um, it works quite well. Um, and then the students will share again, depending upon your time. It is really nice to be able to do at least 2 cards so that they can change roles. Oh, Jenny, right. they, um, do you see Jenny's question? At they don't point? just ask. They, they don't just ask why they need to know they, they, th this is a good questioning activity. It builds the questioning skills of students. Um, Jenny was thinking that. The only question that the student ever asked is. What is the, like the problem? No, they have to ask detailed questions. Yes, they have to really, it's almost like playing the game clue. Yes. You're trying to come up with. The person who has the problem needs to come up in, with enough information um, from the info person as they can. And sometimes the info person doesn't have the answer to that question. So the problem person, and again, it sounds complicated, but then once you do it, um, the kids really, really like it. And it's so rich in communication. But sometimes what happens is the problem person has to go back and say, ask themselves, wait a minute, if that person doesn't have this information, what other information could help me? And then ask that question to the info person. And this goes on, usually it takes about three or four questions and then they're ready to solve it. Yeah, but I don't know that they, well, when I have done something similar to this, I don't know that I would let students, I mean, if a student just had to say, what's the value of A, but I would hope the student might be asking, um, you know, is, is there a vertex or, you know, what is the, or what is the point of, you know, what is the Y intercept? Something like that. Um, well, notice also in the info there that you could go ahead and ask what the value of A is. But if you ask for the value of B, that's a perfect example. The student with the fair. info card would say, I'm sorry, I don't have, I have the that. value of B. So that's when the problem student has to go back and think, oh, wait a minute, what does B mean? Well, B is that additive component that's going to move something left and right. Um, that's not gonna help me. Um, so maybe I need something else. You know, and you have to remember the student with the 1st card is also having to come up with the function. So, it, it's not like the person that has the info card is any worse off or better off necessarily than the problem card. Because they themselves have to also come up with a function. Notice the difference in. Um, card 1 problem and card 2 problem the person with the info. Doesn't know what the question is. So in card one, yes, they're coming up with what the function, what the transformation function is. Um, but in card two, the person with the problem is just what transformations have occurred. So, you know, depending upon how you set up your um, information and your problems, you are really getting the students in this case to manipulate um, and understand what we have just explored. And and Robin asked about videos. I'm trying to think if illustrative math in some of their PD has, I, I know in, in illustrative math, they explain this in, in more detail as well, but I can't remember if they have any videos or not. This is something that is really, um, I don't know if they have any videos of it, but they also, they have informational cards mm -hmm. that um, will describe the activity. Yes. And again, they don't bring in the back to back. That was something that I um, like to do with my kids and the mini whiteboards were something because a lot of times the kids are just doing it in their notebook. And as a teacher who's going around through the classroom to see how they're doing and, you know, hopefully they're persevering. It is hard. It becomes, it's very hard in the beginning. And then after a few times that you've used this routine, the kids, again, routines, they become accustomed to, and it becomes, I mean, my kids used to ask for, are we going to do an info gap? Because 
it became fun. Well, and they get to stand up and move and that just that helps as well. So, so our second dessert is one that you may be a little bit more familiar with. It's a which one? No, this is your exit ticket. Never mind. This is your exit ticket. Okay, which is actually like a second dessert. It is. And this was one again, depending upon your time. Remember how we started out the lesson with a graphic organizer here. We could give be giving an exit ticket, which is notice. It's really just asking them putting it all together and making sure that they understood um, what this transformation lesson was all about. So what do I know about four square roots of X plus two minus three? And it says, notice the difference here without using your graphing device. And again, you could use your graphing device after you have completed this to check yourself. Okay. So here we have the graph. Again, we don't put a table in there, but it's, it is suggested um, in uh, the stem of this. So domain, range, intercepts, graph, table of values, symmetry, increasing, decreasing. So all words that we really want our students to be able to be familiar with when describing functions. And honest to goodness, a lot of students will default to building a table to graph. If they're not comfortable with actually the idea of the parent function and the transformations. So your third dessert, I got out of order, is one that I think a lot of you probably are more familiar with. Daniel's site, WODB. Uh, um, uh, I think it's CA for Canada. Um, something that I have used a lot since it's come out. You probably have as well. But one thing that I have always found that I like to do, and again, I just made this with uh, again taking a screenshot on the emulator. To me, it was more telling for my students if I knew in which order they figured out which one didn't belong because I could reveal more about their level um, because maybe students would look at me and say, okay, I'm going to start with number four because they're all three are going down. And maybe I go next to number three because one goes up and one goes down. And if that's the level that they're at, then that's fine versus something else. Okay. Um, so again, they list in order and, and they don't have to have a, a you know, they, they can do this using his website and using one of the pictures. Just, you know, make sure that they answer in order. Don't don't write one, two, three, four, but they write down first the first one that they are drawn to as the one that doesn't belong. And then the most important question, of course, is why? So this one doesn't belong because why? Because the because, so like Nancy, I think these are all going down. Why do you think this one doesn't belong? And and I looked at that right away and I thought, oh, that doesn't belong because all the vertices are along the um, horizontal axis. Okay. So, and again, we're giving voice to all of our students because both of those are perfectly acceptable answers. And then last but not least, Nancy, talk about our mix six. Okay. Well, our mix six, have you ever heard about a mix six? Which Vicky um, was just in the free cow. So there you go. And so we have a, there's actually on um, education.ti.com's website. If you go to professional development and go to the library um, of webinars, uh, Vicki Carter and Tony Record um, did a uh, webinar on, have you ever heard of Mix 6? And Vicki was the one responsible for bringing it across the pond um, to us. And it was something that I was curious about. And I looked at this and I said, wow, is this something that um, we could use as a primarily, I think, as a review activity? Um, it kind of reflects a little bit of uh, bring it back Bloom's taxonomy here. Uh, it starts out with just factual recall, um, carry out a procedure, classify. And take a look at that first row. Uh, just take an idea, get an idea of notice the first one, factual recall. Uh, describe how the change of the equation affects the graph of the parent function. Now that's that's from our explore section. And so we're looking for that description. And again, it it stares out at me as, oh, that first one, that's my dilation, that's my multiplicative. Um, change and that's not going to give me a congruent graph. 
And then B and C are my additive um, transformations. And what are they doing? Oh, one moves it left and right. The other one moves it, as Tammy said, we know that last one should be familiar to us from point slope form or slope intercept form from algebra one as well. Um, carrying out a procedure, um, basically we're evaluating a function. So how would we find that table of values um, if these are the particular A, B, and C values? And we want to input using function notation, let's find F of nine and evaluate what that is. So I purposely threw in there uh, letter B, which is F of zero um, with the values that I gave so that getting back, I love the way this is like circular reasoning. And somebody said in the very beginning when they looked at the square root function that the graph was all in quadrant one. Well, kind of getting back to that domain of the radical function. When we look at F of zero for these values of A, B, and C, it turns out to be um, a non-real value. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, then going to number three, and here it's you're classifying what type of transformations are going to occur um, based upon, is it going to be a multiplicative transformation? Is it going to be an additive where we're shifting left or right? Is it going to be an additive where we're shifting up or down? And then R for reflection. So in the right-hand column, we're given um, three different equations for G and students need to write in the left column what type of transformations are occurring. Hey, Nancy. Um, yes. Every, as, as our speaker said in the first opening session, as Paul said, everybody's cleaning off their desk and backing up. The bell's about to ring. Right. Um, do, do we want to see if people mind hanging on for the bell for you to go over the last three of these and us to do a closing? Um, Eric, is that okay? Or do we need to go ahead and, and finish up since there's not a, since there's not a session right after this one is the lunch break. Sure. Um, I think we would probably go an extra few minutes here to cover 4, 5 and 6. Okay. okay. And then I'll, I, I can wrap it up afterwards. Okay. Thank Thanks, you. Eric. Okay. So course, just, thank any, you. <laughs> just quickly going through it, um, for 4, 5 and 6, we're now kind of moving up. Uh, Bloom's taxonomy, and we're looking, it's the questions are becoming more apply and interpret and figure out what you need from that, that table of values that Tammy's been emphasizing here. So in this case, um, you know, it's not a run of the mill question. Function H has the following values at the selected values of X. So we have the table um, with really more information that's needed than needed. Um, but when we first look at that, we are not aware of that. And then we have this G function, um, that is a times H of X minus B plus C. So they're getting this functional notation that hopefully they will become familiar with. It's not something that I would think, you know, your students are going to feel comfortable with right away unless they see it, um, more often. So we're looking for. Um, how to apply what we have for information into solving that um, question. So you can see that it, it's got some heavy duty mathematics involved in it. And then extending the concept, um, again, a little bit more application. And then finally, which is, is a nice, interesting one to end up with, and a mix six is always set up um, this way, uh, where number six is critique of fallacy. So, um, and again, I was thinking after listening to our speaker this morning, um, when you <laughs> pick a name to put in here, I used Martin because Martin happened to be in my class and had come up with his own rule for transformations, but you would be able to, you know, change that to however, uh, you wanted. But this is just an example of, okay, we're going to do this with the transformations. Is that the correct equation to explain those transformations? 
So if you're not familiar with MIG-6, you really do need to go and get familiar with MIG-6 because, yes, they, they are phenomenal. So we're going to close with this quote from uh, Pele. Um, you have today, um, as teachers, because you love what you do, you have sacrificed your Saturday. You have come to learn something. Hopefully you're going to take that back. So success was not an accident for you. It was hard work. You did persevere. You did learn, you came to study, you sacrificed your Saturday, just like we said, and hopefully your students really do know that you do love them, that you love what you're doing, and that you did give up a Saturday to learn something more to help them. Nancy, your closing thoughts? It's funny because Tammy always looks at that as uh, all of the sacrifice that all of you are putting into it, and I also think about my students, and I'm thinking about that learning mathematics is hard work. It is perseverance. Um, and I, I truly believe that when they see their teacher as a person who loves what they're doing um, and we make it enjoyable for them by coming up with activities that may appeal to their learning styles, um, hopefully that math family that we have all, you know, comes together and, and actually looks forward to doing that math. Okay. As you're writing in questions, Eric. Wonderful. Um, my goodness, thank you, Nancy and Tammy both for, for sharing your expertise. What a, what a fabulous hour. And um, thank you to everyone for attending. Um, and without any further ado, we've got um, the lucky winner of a TI graphing calculator is Sherry Orr. So congratulations, Sherry. We will follow up via email early next week um, about uh, claiming your prize. And um, next week, everyone will receive a follow-up email with links to the recordings of not just um, this session, but all of today's sessions. Um, along with um, associated resources, so PDFs, PowerPoints, activities, and a certificate of attendance. Um, so again, um, thanks again to, to Nancy and Tammy, and thank you all for joining, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your virtual T-Cubed IC experience today. Thanks so much. Thanks. And I did put the link in there if you want the materials before Monday because somebody wanted to use them next week. <laughs> so I did drop the material, the link in there, and then they will come out for everybody. And if you really do want to see more of those kinds of things, Vicki was on that panel for the AP Pre-Cal, and she shared a folder. I haven't looked at it yet, but she may have a mix six in there as well. She has a Dropbox folder um, that is open to everyone. So if you look up Vicki or you go to that, um, webinar that I mentioned, webinar, yes. you'll be able to get many more mix six right from that Dropbox. The other thing, just real quickly, is if you have questions about anything that we've gone through, because we've gone through so much, you have our emails, and we'd ha be happy to answer any of those questions. For sure. Thanks, Eric, for facilitating us. Of Thank course. You, Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Enjoy the rest of your day. Take care.